What is up guys, Awesome Nerd Show here, and today we're doing a brand new series called Monday Night Rewind. We're going back 20 years in reverse to 1997, and we're reviewing old Rawls and Nitros. So we did a similar um, a series similar to this um, early in the year. We started at, at the very beginning of the year, but um, with time, and I didn't have the um, uh, technology to do what I wanted, and I still don't, so that's why I do it in this form. It's kind of like a podcast, so you're going to hear my voice on top of uh, visual, like pictures and stuff of wrestlers and various sorts of things. And so, just going to go through um, an episode corresponding to the current uh, week or t day or whatever um, back in '97. So, like this one, we're going to start out with um, just July 28th, 1997. So, of course, we did skip a whole bunch, which I um, wish we didn't or I didn't have to. I was going to do, you know, a whole series um, of nonstop, you know, every single week. But, like I said, didn't have the time at the po that point. I still currently kind of don't, but I'm going to – I want to do this. So, I'm trying to force myself to. Um, but that and then technology and everything. So, of course, we're going to start with Raw. Now, as I said before, if, like I said, if you never saw this series, I was a Raw – um, back in 97, I would have, at this point, I would have been five, maybe, but I do remember, um, wrestling in 97. Of course, I grew up watching a bunch of, like, VHS tapes and stuff like that, because we d didn't have cable to get, um, USA Network or, um, TBS, TNT, or whatever that WCW's on. So, er everything I watched was on, uh, VHS tape, um... So ever since I can remember, I've been watching wrestling, but I actually remember watching Raw because we got cable in 97. So I remember um, being able or watching Raw and stuff like that starting in 97 because I remember the stuff that comes up a little bit in a couple months. Um, so but we're just going to start off with um, Raw. Like I said, I'm going to go through pretty much just do recap. I'm going to go break down, um, like say what happened in segments, what happened in matches. I'm not going to go, you know, move by move through matches. Just kind of like the big stuff, cool moves, um, anything that I think will fulfill in a bigger like story type thing. Um, I will mention stuff and then of course we'll move on to Nitro. Um, so at this point in time, Raw and Nitro were both two hours long. So we have si similar episodes where when I started before, Raw was one hour, Nitro was two hours. So um, it kind of uh, like was a weird because you'd only have a certain, you know, like three matches I think were on Raw and then however many on Nitro. Um, but we're going to go ahead and start with Raw. So of course this was in um, 97, right before the Attitude Era. And so a lot of big stuff's revolving around uh, Bret Hart. And of course, this will lead up to, of course, the um, leaning up to with things with Shawn Michaels and Bret Hart and their feud and stuff, uh, Undertaker in here, Stone Cold, all that stuff. But of course, back at this time, um, two hour show with, um, of course, Vince McMahon, uh, Jerry the King Waller, and JR Jim Ross as commentators. Um, and they did the whole show where in a um, little while they ended up splitting it from the beginning of Raw with um, Raw is War at the. Um, second hour and then they you know add different people switch people up so like i said we're starting off with the round this took place in pittsburgh um pittsburgh pennsylvania i forget what the arena was but it doesn't really matter um so of course the show started off with a recap of the week before where um the heart foundation challenged um an american team in to to like face them in a tag match when they're in um or they were in canada and when they challenged an american team to come out and face them and so of course it was answered by stone cold Shawn michaels dude love and the undertaker um and then of course at this it's um mentioning that uh sean michaels is going to be the special guest referee at a uh uh, SummerSlam, or when Shawn Michaels comes out during that, because it starts off, I put him in order, so Stone Cold uh, comes out, then Shawn Michaels, and um, or answers, Stone Cold answers, then Shawn Michaels comes out, and then he says that he's going to be the special guest ref referee at the SummerSlam, which is coming up, um, and then of course, Do Love, then Undertaker, all respond coming out, and then um, during the thing, it also, like I said, I'm Blanking, I wrote the stuff down, but I can't remember what happened. But I know, um, because of like events that took place, Brett comes out and um, attacks uh, uh, Vince and Sean from the week before. Um, because I think Sean was on commentary, and so Brett comes out and uh, attacks him. Like I said, I don't remember the whole thing. And so, anyways, the flag match takes place, um, and the Heart Foundation ends up winning. But I think with that whole like attack on Vince and stuff, it was more like him didn't like actually attack him, like hit him or anything, but they kind of, uh, he like went over and started destroying the commentary table and that sort of stuff, throwing stuff off of it, smashing screens and everything. 
Um, but then we get into the start of the show where um, Jared does an interview with the Heart Foundation or Heart Foundation, but Brett in the ring. So of course you have Brett as a, obviously since he's the one that's being interviewed. Then you have Owen Hart, British Bulldog. Um, I don't know if Jim Neidhart was with them yet. I can't remember if he was there. Um, I assume he was since because I think he was there from the beginning of the Heart Foundation. And then Brian Pillman were all in the ring. Um, so they're talking about the discipline for, uh, Brett's actions from the, uh, week before, um, saying, you know, uh, cause of the stuff he said, like the stuff he did in attacking, uh, Vince and stuff like that at the, um, commentary table. And so, um, they mentioned that, uh, JR mentioned that Grill Monsoon next week will be back cause he's currently the acting president of WWE or WWF at this time. Um, and so that he's going to name a new commissioner, um, since he can't be there all the time, he's going to name a commissioner to be like the current um, general managers that you see on Raw and SmackDown today. And that he's going to lay down a law on um, Brett's actions and that sort of thing. Um, and so then Brett starts talking and he's um, talking about how, you know, he's been screwed many times. And especially in America, they know how to screw you. And that he will keep his word, um, even though he never actually meant it. But he will keep his word about never wrestling in America again if he loses at SummerSlam, which will be in a ma title match against The Undertaker. And that he ends up, you know, keeps getting screwed. And yet while Shawn Michaels, uh, or that he's always there, you know, and getting screwed. And Shawn Michaels gets to sit at home looking for his quote unquote smile as he um, did when he had uh, won the championship back at um, the Royal Rumble. And then like in February ended up saying he had to go find his smile or whatever that whole thing was. And um, so then he continues on, of course, running down America, um, saying that America is a giant um, toilet bowl. And if you were to give it, America an enema, you'd stick it right there in Pittsburgh, or you'd stick, yeah, stick the enema um, hose right there in Pittsburgh, and then he kind of, which I thought wasn't too bad of a joke, but then he responds back, because you're the pits, and that just um, kind of lost it for me, and so while the crowd starts, you know, like booing and screaming at Brett and everything, Pillman's up yelling back at the crowd, um, he tells, uh, yells at the crowd to shut the fuck up, and so that is caught on camera or like on camera and stuff him saying that so that's kind of interesting like obviously you couldn't like hear him say it but you could see that's what he said and then he ends up uh brett ends up challenging uh the patriot because patriot um ended up getting like involved um in a match the week before interfering so the patriot which we'll get i guess we'll just wait till we get to later uh, but he's kind of a interesting person but so he's gonna challenge um the patriot to a match um later in the night as the uh, main event and so that is the end of that segment so of course then they leave and everything and then we get a match between the los bariquas and it's um savio vega and i miguel i forget what his last name is but they're gonna be facing off against the legion of doom hawk and animal um, so it starts off with a recap showing um that two weeks prior um during a match the godwins had come out so um henry and phineas godwin came out and attacked the lod um before a match during the process henry which is um i say like the bigger of the two and he was the first godwin that was in the wwf he does his move called the slop drop on which is like a reverse ddt almost like the guy um the guy getting the ddt is um back down or back is facing the ground instead of face first facing the ground but he draws it on the ramp in the back of hawk's head busted um open and he's bleeding and all that and then they claim that he's got a concussion which that's kind of interesting that at this point in time you know they are talking about concussions and stuff but they don't treat it the way they treat concussions currently nowadays um so i thought that was interesting but anyway, um, so we get into the match. Like I said, I'm not going to go step by step, but just an interesting thing. So there's a move where um, Savio is holding um, Hawk's feet um, while Hawk is like throat first. Like, you know, he's got his arms up by his head and he's hanging on the top rope. And so Savio picks his feet up so he's completely off the ground. And then Miguel, um, of course, bounces off the ropes on the other side and runs and jumps up over Savio's back. Um, up over Savio and lands on um, Hawk's back like you know smashing him down into the ropes so I thought that was kind of an interesting move and if you've seen like Savio and Miguel and stuff they're bigger guys so um, seeing them do that was kind of interesting I assume that would hurt Hawk um, pretty badly with all that weight coming down on him and every 
um, onto the top rope and stuff. Um, Miguel does do a standing moonsault, but it's not done very well. But it, again, interesting and in seeing such a large guy doing a standing moonsault. Um, so he does that. Then the LOD gets set up for the Doomsday device um, with Miguel on uh, Hawk. Sh or and I can't. I think Hawk usually lifts him up, and Animal does the dive off the top rope. But it, um, they were doing it on Miguel. But the other Breek was um, come in and interfere, so the match ends, obviously, um, within um, DQ. And the Godwins end up coming out, and um, Henry grabs and slop drops Hawk again on the outside of the ring. Of course, they're on the mats this time. And then he grabs their slot bucket and dumps it on top of um, Hawk. And during this whole time, Animal is being attacked by the Bariquas. And so then that ends that whole match segment. Then next up, we have tri a Triple H interview. Uh, he's backstage. It's him in China. And Vince is talking to him in the back. So um, they have a recatch of all his matches that um, were lean up with man or before with Mankind. So all the um, they've had multiple matches and they ended up having a uh, match that led backstage at the Canadian Stampede. Which was the pay-per-view prior to this. And this is leading to SummerSlam where I believe they have a cage match. Yeah, and I believe that ends up leading to Cactus Jack coming back. Is what I believe all this leads up to if I remember right. And then he's got a match with Vader. And so he's um, mentioned that tri the Triple H this is. Mentions that Vader keeps asking what time it is. And he responds but, um, and Triple H says... Um, that it's Ginny Craig time, which if you don't know, the 90s Ginny Craig was a very popular like weight loss system. And I remember like the commercials from the old days and stuff of like the um, 1-800 Ginny 20 or something like that and stuff. So yeah, I was just like saying that he needed to go on uh, a diet type thing and stuff. So it was a little kind of a funny joke there. So then we come back with the actual match uh, between Triple H with China against Vader and he has Paul Bear with him. But as Vader and Paul Bear are um, walking down to the ring, um, you see a camera guy come up behind Triple H and he ends up attacking him and it's Mankind dressed as the cameraman, which in the footage they show originally, you do see, you know, you see the cameraman and you can see he's wearing Mankind's face mask come up but then they show like a replay later on like it's from a different angle it's from like the hard camera angle and you see mankind you know he's in like the jumpsuit that the cameraman so they wore like a solid blue jumpsuit back then and you see him in the outfit he comes in grabs the camera from the camera guy and then attacks uh triple h of course his name is hunter Hearst Sampley. i don't know if he goes by triple h at this point Mostly goes by Hunter, but I just call him Triple H for um, shortening the name. And then during this, uh, China gets up on the top rope while Mankind's attacking Triple H. And uh, Mankind runs over, like hits the ropes. And so she falls and racks herself. So they're kind of playing up the whole, like, is she a man type thing. And then they end up fighting out of the ring and going out into the crowd. Um, and they fight through the crowd a lot. And then Mankind... I, I can't remember if they come back or if they just fight through disappearing, but then that's when they say that their SummerSlam match will be a cage match. And then the next segment we have up is the Truth Commission interview and comments with the Commandant, which is their leader, and uh, it's just them standing in the back room, and he just makes comments, you know, that they're here to take over the World Wrestling Federation and that sort of things. Then it cuts to a Brockus segment or vignette of him saying, you know, that he's coming and he's going to beat all these people, but yet Brockus never makes air, at least that I know of. I've never seen him on any pay-per-views or any Raws. So again, we're getting segments that never happen. And then we get a weird, kind of a weird mixed tag match with, um, so we get Bob Holly, Flash Funk, and uh, Jesse James, which is Road Dog, as you know, but before it became the Road Dog that we know of. So that's what I'm saying, like the weird mix-up, but they're all pretty much would be like a early job squad um but it's them versus the truth commission um and this is their like in-ring debut or premiere whatever and uh so the truth commission is made up of recon which is also known as bull buchanan that he was you know known later as bull buchanan or b2 or b squared something like that then you have the interrogator which is uh kurgan or later becomes kurgan and uh, he's the seven foot tall guy. He's an actor now. He's been in um, movies. I believe probably the one I can remember the most is Pacific Rim. But he's kind of cool and stuff. They're obviously none of them are really any good wrestlers. But the Truth Commission ends up, ends up getting the rim uh, win. And Kurgan uh, wins with the side slam on uh, Bob Holly 
for the pin. So that then moves on to our next thing, which um, Vince, which these are funny. Vince ends up calling a kid for the million dollar challenge. So it's um, a chance to win a million dollars at SummerSlam. So he's calling these um, people, you know, that submitted stuff and they um, got their names drawn or whatever. And they're winning tickets to SummerSlam. And then at SummerSlam, those people will then get their, um, one of them will win a million dollar challenge or the challenge. So they have, I believe it's a casket full of, uh, what's supposed to be a million dollars. Um, and they have Sunny like, you know, doing like a Vanna White. She's like holding up money and, um, just trying to look sexy and stuff like that. And so they call the kid that, um, I, I believe it's a young kid, but he, that ends up answering. And so he ends up winning. Of course, he, Vince is like, you've won two tickets to SummerSlam or whatever. And, um, the kid ends up, how many people can I take? And he's like, well, you can take, I guess, two people. <laughs> and the kid's like, awesome or whatever. But I just thought that was funny, even though he's already said how many tickets. But then we come up with um, a Patriot interview, which Patriot's also known as uh, Del Wilkes and stuff. And it's talking about his match with Brett, that he will accept um, Brett's challenge and that he doesn't like the horrible things Brett has been saying um, about America, which I will go back on this. This, I was, um, because... I think it's in either late August or September, sometime around there. Um, there's no WW or there's no Raw for like two weeks. So when I get to that, it'll just be Nitro reviews. Um, but I was going to try and like, you know, just jump, you know, s go like skip ahead to more um, Raws and then do that. So there would always be one. But then the timing is all messed up. It's like, I want to try and keep everything on the same dates and stuff. Um, but the Raw, I so I'd watched a, um, earlier Raw from like two weeks or whatever before. And you get the famous, at least to me personally, it's a famous interview, um, with Brett, uh, it, where they're in Canada talking about, um, this difference between Canada and America. And, you know, he's saying the stuff that, um, runs very similar to our modern day society and politics and stuff like that. But he makes the comment, you know, like here in Canada, we actually care for our sick and um, the needy and stuff. And then that we have um, health care to take care of those people and, or take care of everyone. We have, they have uh, gun control. So everyone's not, are not being shot on every street corner. And so that's very um, stuff resonates still today. Cause we, at least here in America, we have very similar um, discussions still going on. So I just thought that um, part was interesting. And so it's that sort of stuff that Del Wilkes is saying that he doesn't like. And then the whole Pittsburgh stuff about being where you'd stick the enema nozzle. Um, but then we get a cr um, match between Crush and the DOA versus Farouk of the Nation of Domination. And they have Ahmed Johnson. So this is the weird part where um, the nations grew or got new members. So it's now Fru, Kama, Mustafa, and D'Lo Brown. And then they have um, Ahmed Johnson in there until he gets injured and they eventually replace, replace him with Mark Henry. Um, so this will match, of course, very lean um, came about because um, we have the whole, uh, I think I have it uh, mentioned uh here in a second or something but we have the whole um gang war type thing so we have these different gang groups coming together and fighting each other and so it's the doa nation of domination and the uh los bariquas are the groups um but the like i said the match came about about because um fruk fired crush from the nation of domination he fired both him and savio and that's why we have these three groups um there's a move that goes on here there where crushes um has his head between um fruk's legs kind of like you do for like starting out a power bomb or no because fruk's facing forward and crushes heads like behind him at his butt with his head facing um towards fruk's front it's like a really weird and fruk's like walking around with it well crush ends up lifting um fruk up like onto his shoulders which is cool because Fruk is a big guy, and so Crush is able to lift him up onto his shoulders and stuff, and then does like a backdrop with it. Um, Crush does a pile driver, which again is interesting for times because now, currently, like in WWE and everything, pile drivers are not allowed at all. So, again, to see a pile driver there. Um, and Kama goes to do some sort of move, and he bounces off the ropes. And as he does that, Kama reaches and grabs Crush's legs, and because of that, the uh, Disciples of Apocalypse DOA then gets in the ring and a whole um, brawl just starts with everyone. And then 
during the brawl that um, Los Breek was then come out and started attacking uh, Crush and they do a power um, all four power bomb I believe I would believe it's Savio but could I don't know exactly which one ends up doing like the power bomb but all of them put their hands on Crush and then you know slam him down onto the ramp and so that's the end of that whole schmage fest as you call it so then we get the start of hour two so of course they do the whole big giant fireworks display and then we get the Godwins um, of course, as I said, uh, Henry and Phineas versus Dude Love and Stone Cold because they're the currently tag team or current tag team champs. And it was uh, made because it was Stone Cold and Shawn Michaels as the um, tag team champs. But Shawn being whatever um, ends up not doing uh, like quitting the whole thing because him and Stone Cold don't like each other. And so Mankind or Dude Love now, um, which is still Mankind Mick Foley, um, ends up being saying you know i'll be your partner he's always coming out saying pick me steve and stuff like that um so then we get um or so during that match um owen hart and bulldog are on commentary because you know they're the ones that lost the tag team titles or they won them back at least um so they're at commentary and everything um so uh again some highlights of the match um Dude Love performs a dirt, what would be a de uh, Dirty Deeds or similar to Dean Ambrose's Dirty Deeds, um, which is a um, double arm DDT. So he does that on Phineas. Um, at the um, commentary, uh, Bulldog, uh, British Bulldog, ends up challenging uh, Ken Shamrock to an arm wrestling match, saying you know that he's the strongest in the WWF and that he'll um, take on uh, Ken Shamrock because him and Shamrock have been um, fighting or art whatever feuding. Uh, Austin does a stunner on Phineas, uh, but then Henry knocks him out of the ring, and so while he's outside of the ring. Owen runs up and hits him in the back of the head with um, his Intercontinental title as in Owen's title because he's the current Inter Intercontinental Championship. So that leads to a disqualification. And then um, Bulldog and Owen then are fighting um, ringside and stuff with Dude and Austin leading um, the Henry or the Henry, the Godwins to leave. And then because of the Godwins, you know, being out there, there was still the LOD come out and that also um, forces Bulldog and Owen to run off. So it's um, LOD, um, Dude Love, and Austin in the ring. And then you can see the Godwins and Bulldog and Owen up on the ramp and stuff. So that's the end of that match. Uh, next up, we get a light heavyweight because, of course, they're do um, starting the whole light heavyweight championship uh, or division at this time. And so we get Ace Darling versus Devin Storm. Um, and I tried to look these guys up. I couldn't find or see really who Ace Starling was. He could be somebody and I just didn't recognize it. But um, Devin Storm became later on Crowbar and then some like Judas and stuff like that. Um, but he was Crowbar and TNA or WCW and then like Judas and stuff in TNA. But he looks a lot like Chris Jericho. Like if you saw him in match, you would think it was Chris Jericho. Um, but Devin ends up winning with a powerbomb or... Um, he does so he wins but he goes for a power mom and as he's going to slam ace down ace like does a roll type thing so he rolls out like rolls and so they like flips Devin over but then Devin's able to re-roll that into a pin so it's a roll up pin and during this um, right before the match begins Ken Shamrock um, walks out with a table to um, do the arm wrestling match with that bulldog said he would do tonight and then after that that leads to Vince calling another person for the million dollar uh, challenge um, and of course uh, so another person and he keeps calling a number and he keeps going like the number he that cannot be connected or whatever he calls it um, like twice or he doesn't really call someone else calm but you hear the dial tone and stuff um, and so no one answers twice and so they move on to the next one it comes to a guy who's from Lafayette Indiana which I thought was cool because I'm from Indiana as well, so we got a fellow Hoosier that ended up winning or getting to go to SummerSlam. Um, but so then we come, um, goes back into the ring where Shamrock has the table set up, and so it's going to be him versus British Bulldog in their arm wrestling match or whatever. Um, so then Bulldog obviously comes out and they sit down in the chairs and they, you know, lock hands and stuff to do the arm wrestling. Of course, the whole time this is going on, there's USA chants because obviously British Bulldog is from England, and so people chant USA. Um, and so, of course, they're moving, their hands are going back and forth of like, you know, who's going to win, fluctuating back and forth. And it ends up, Bulldog ends up headbutting uh, Ken Shamrock in the head. Um, 
to break up the match. And then he grabs the chair and hits him um, on the on the head. And then while he's knocked out, British Bulldog takes a jar of dog food and um, pushes it into Shamrock's mouth and face. Then next up, we have Gold Dust with Marlena against Rockabilly with Honky Tonk Man. So Rockabilly's um, Billy Gun, if you didn't know. Um, so before the match happens, Goldust and Marlena in the ring, and there's a mannequin outside of the ring wearing what I thought looked like an evening gown dress, but uh, Marlena says it's one of her dresses. Um, but they're saying, you know, they're going to have a match, and if uh, with Brian Pillman, and if Brian Pillman loses, he's going to have to wear one of Marlena's uh, dresses. Um, so that's why the mannequin and dress are down there. But then, so Rockabilly comes out, or Billy Gunn um, comes out and stuff, and then they start the match. And soon after the match starts, Billy ends up uh, getting out of the ring and um, goes up and gets in the face of, a, I think he's a boxer um, named Michael Moore. And so Billy's like shadow boxing in front of him and everything. And so uh, Michael Moore ends up slapping, uh, or no, Billy ends up slapping Michael. And Michael, you know, kind of like steps back a little or whatever. And then he ends up winding back and punching Billy right in the face. So Billy goes out. So the match is pretty much done for. And then while that's all going on, uh, Pillman ends up coming out and attacking Goldust from behind. Where uh, Marlena ends up jumping onto his back and... Um, you know, trying to choke him and all that stuff. And he gets her off and then they leave the ring. Uh, then we get a package on Undertaker, which is a weird thing because it's like a bunch of f footage from his career, like matches and stuff. But it's got a bunch of all the different, like all different wrestlers. And they're just saying how great the Undertaker is that, you know, he's a phenomenal talent and all this sort of stuff. So it's just like a weird package to have at this point in time. Then we get an HBK um, interview because he comes out to the ring um, for an interview with Vince, and um, he claims, you know, that he won't apologize um, to Brett for um, interfering in uh, matches. Or I forget what um, HBK even did, or yeah, what he really even did. I don't know if he like said stuff. Like I said, I I saw this stuff before, <laughs> knowing like what he did, but I can't remember now. I didn't write it down for some reason. But he says he will not apologize, and that he's coming out here to the ring and is going to sit at commentary and do commentary because he can't. He doesn't feel safe sitting in the back because of all the enemy he's enemies he has back there, and so he's just going to sit ringside. And he says, "Don't worry, Vince. I'm going to take your seat and stuff." So it makes it seem like Vince won't be commentating, but he is at the commentary table. And so um, then we get um, that leading up then straight into the Brett. Um, Hart versus the Patriot match and as I mentioned before and stuff the Patriot has um, Kurt Angle's music so he has Kurt Angle's music before Kurt Angle's um, in WWF but he's a guy he wears of course red white and blue but he wears like a luchador mask with uh, um, one of the like I think they call them like iron eagles or something like that like a, the old eagle logo like military eagle logo on his mask um but so they come out and each plays their national anthem and national anthem. And so Brett, of course, does the Canadian national anthem first. And then Patriot comes out and then they do, of course, um, our national anthem, the Star Spangled Banner. And during that, Brett ends up attacking the Patriot and then their match starts. And so, um, again, some highlights of Patriot and does like a missile thing off the top rope. So he obviously he gets the top rope and then he just shoots off like a missile missile and does like a shoulder tackle to Brett. Um, there's one point match where Patriot has like a full Nelson on Brett and Brett is like trying to counter. Like he gets over to the corner turnbuckle and he's, I don't know if he's like just trying to get up and like push off of it to fall back since Patriot's behind him or if he's trying to do almost like a, um, slice bread or, type thing where he runs up and like flips over i'm not exactly sure but uh brett ends up um trying like i said trying to do the reverse but when they end up falling back um they fall onto um earl hebner the referee and so earl hebner you know gets knocked out or whatever and so brett tries to pin but the ref's down so he nothing happens so he beats up, up on him a little more on the Patriot and then covers again. And during this time, Sean runs up and like grabs Brett's leg off of the pin. And so Brett's up, you know, yelling at Sean. And during this time, the Patriot comes back and grabs Brett and rolls him up for the pin. And at this point, the ref comes or wakes up again. And so he counts the three. And so the Patriot ends up getting the win. And so that pisses Brett off. And then uh, Sean um, gets up on the table and is like dancing and stuff trying like provoking brett and everything like just up there like nan and a boo boo you lost and stuff and during that um time the undertaker bell starts gonging but 
he never ends up coming out and then the show ends so that is it gonna be it for raw so next up is night wcw nitro from july 28th 1997 and this time it takes place in charleston west virginia and here for the first hour we're gonna have tony Schiavone, larry zabisco and mike Tanay on commentary and so the show opens up with the nitro girls so when i was watching this early in the year the nitro girls had not yet been introduced but they start to show here and of course they show up like I don't know what their time frame is, but they show up like between a bunch of matches. Um, so I don't think I wrote all the Nitro Girl things though, because they don't really matter. But you can, I was saying like if compared to like WWE nowadays, if they had the Nitro Girls, I would expect that the girls would be spot on in their dancing, but there's always girls that are off. They're not all in coordination. And I just feel like, you know, if it was WCW nowadays, I could, or WWE nowadays, I could hear like Vince just in the back, like just probably laughing one because they're so bad but just like yelling and screaming like why are these people so bad but i just think you know that's wcw for you getting thinking this is a good idea but the girls really aren't that good um but our first match is the mwo of buff bagwell and scott norton and they come out with vincent versus the four horsemen of um rick flair and mr perfect so the whole time a uh, commentary is like you know, they're questioning, is Mr. Perfect, or he's going by Kurt Henning because he can't go by Mr. Perfect, um, whether he's a part of the Horseman or not, because nothing's ever been uh, mentioned, whether, he, you know, he is for sure or not. So Scott Norton does, because, you know, Scott Norton's like a, I think he's a strong man and, you know, power lifter probably and stuff like that. But him and Perfect start out and uh, Mr. Perfect, or he ends up uh, sl uh, chopping Mr. Perfect. And when he does, Perfect ends up uh, flipping up and over the top rope. So, you know, it's showing, you know, his selling of uh, Scott Norton's power and stuff. And then their the, um, commentary is saying that, you know, this match is a match of um, power versus brains with power of Buff and Scott Norton versus, you know, the excellent um, wrestling technique and everything of Flair and Mr. Perfect. So of course, obviously with Flair match, you had a bunch of Flair chops. I was trying to count, but then he just started chopping everyone. So I lost count of the whole thing. Um, and then I noticed that their tag, since this is a tag match, you know, you have a person from each team and standing in the corner waiting. And I noticed that they're the opposite of, um, WWF's like the corners are opposite. So if you picture what W, um, WWE is today, they're just in the, other corners not so in the different corners so it's just kind of weird but it um ends up with flair ends up getting a figure four uh on buff bagwell and so while he's got bagwell in the figure four scott norton and um kurt henning end up coming in they are fighting each other and during this time bagwell ends up escaping the figure four and uh so then they get everything back underway and so flair's on the outside you know waiting to be tagged and everything and um x pac or six six pack six pac whatever he went by but um one two three kid all that he ends up comes running out and he grabs apron or he grabs flair up on the apron to like pull him off but he grabs him by his pants and so when he pulls it down he just completely shows uh, flair's butt and so everyone got mooned but uh kurt henning ends up getting the win on uh i think it was uh buff i believe um, with his fisherman suplex or the perfect plex as it used to be called so this first match so next up we get lex luger and an in-ring interview with uh gino mean gene okerlin um so he comes out obviously and they um discuss their match at sturgis at hog wild that's coming up that he's got against hulk hogan and um he, he talks about how he's been in the gym working on his peaks because um Hogan had made comments that um, Luger wasn't looking um, his best and not in shape, so he was showing off his body that he has been working, and that Hogan's not there, you know, tonight or whatever, and that he's off filming some movie. I'm not exactly sure which movie. I, I know um, before it was mentioned that he was doing Three Ninjas, but I don't know if um, that was the movie he's doing at this point in time or not. Um, but then... Uh, he says that the lawyers have been talking, you know, saying that Hogan ha with the um, being the uh, heavyweight champion that you have to defend your title every or within every 30 days and that Hogan wouldn't have done that by um, hog wild. So next week they're going to have a title match in Detroit. Then next up we have Prince Ikea versus the Ultimate Dragon or the Ultimo Dragon and the Ultimate Dragon is... Um, in WCW, he goes by Ultimate, but he's also known as Ultimo. 
Um, I think in like Japan, I believe he's from Japan, but he is the TV champion. Um, so of course, another some more highlights is Ultima, uh, Ultimate Dragon ends up doing the um, headstand on the turnbuckle, similar to what uh, Jack Gallagher currently does today. Um, but he ended up uh, doing a move off of it instead of just you know putting his legs down or whatever to stop people from running over that Jack Gallagher does. But he ends up doing um, I don't know if I think he ended up doing like a double foot kick. Uh, to uh, Prince Ikea. Um, Ikea does a superplex off the second rope, so not all the way off the top, but off the second rope. Um, Ultimo Dragon does uh, a moonsault, or goes for a moonsault, but Prince Ikea moves, and Ultimo Dragon ends up landing on his feet. Then they start, you know, just doing a whole bunch of moves, and a lot of them are botched, and I don't know exactly what's going on, but Ultimo Dragon, like, does a move, completely misses, um, Prince IK and so it's just kind of a whole mess but that's what you get when you you know move real fast with um, moves and everything but um dragon ends up getting the win using his dragon sleeper which is just like a um, reverse DDT that they just hold or it's like a headlock but a reverse and stuff next up we have another mean gene interview um with uh Ric Flair and then the horsemen but this time it's at the entrance ramp which I always thought that's interesting how um, WCW did that but we get so Mean Gene's questioning questioning Flair you know is uh, Kurt Henning a member of the four horsemen and Ho Flair's you know like of course he is and all this sort of stuff and then the other members end up uh, horsemen members end up coming out um, which is Chris Benoit uh, Steve Mongo McMichaels and Kurt Henning and uh, I think Flair ends up like is just like dancing around like doing his flyer stuff but Kurt says that he's not a member or he's not like a signed member of the four horsemen and that he's a free agent and so you know he's saying he's not but flair and the other horsemen are saying he is but then that leads to a match um of Chris Benoit and Steve Mongo McMichaels against um what are two guys called the Texas Hangman I looked him up I didn't recognize either of their um, other names that they've went by or anything so I don't know much about them but uh, Mongo ends up doing a uh, like a football tackle to one of the hangman's legs and I, so I thought that was going to lead to you know them working over the leg but it never did um, Tony uh, Shivani ends up getting a call at the commentary table a phone call from uh, Kevin Nash and Scott Hall who are saying that they're in Michigan so I assume like Detroit or something um, but they say they're in Michigan looking you know for um, fans of Scott of uh, the Steiners because obviously they're from uh, University of Michigan and or they went to University of Michigan and so they were looking for fans there and that would be there in Michigan but they can't find any and then um, Hall and ends up um, like insulting Zabisco and saying you know that he's talking enough for an old man and um, that they challenge you know anytime you want to fight we'll fight and the, um, then they also add in there, you know, that Luger won't beat Hulk Hogan at, um, in their title match next week. So back to the match, uh, Mongo ends up tombstoning, uh, tombstoning one of the Texas hangmen, but he's not the legal man, so there's a whole little um, botch going on there with that, because um, both hint, all four guys are in the ring, and like I said, uh, it's uh, Chris Benoit and one of the other the other hangman are the legal men. But in the background, Mongo is doing a tombstone to the other one. Benoit ends up putting the, his hangman that he was, or no, I think he was actually doing to the one that Mongo gave the tombstone to. So that may have actually been the correct hangman. Um, but he puts him in the crossface, but the refs, um, and he starts tapping, but the ref didn't count it because the hangman was under the, like, from his, like, knees down was under the rope. So, you know. It counts as a break, technically. And so Chris ends up pulling uh, him out of the way, reapplying the crossface and getting the win for that. Then next up, we get an Alex Wright, the Wunderkin, versus uh, Chris Jericho, which is the Cruiserweight uh, champion. So this is a good uh, technical chain wrestling match. Um, uh, Chris Jericho ends up uh, doing a move where um, uh, Alex Wright is like standing on the outside apron because he keeps rolling out of the ring. But he's up on the apron. Chris Jericho runs, um, jumps into the corner turnbuckle. Like I think he's on, gets on the second uh, rope, jumps over the um, top rope, like, you know, without just like completely clears it and does like a shoulder tackle to Alex Wright. And then, of course, they both uh, fall to the floor. But Alex Wright ends up getting the win 
with a German suplex that, you know, obviously after a suplex, he bridges um, into the pin. And so he is the new cruiserweight champion. Um, next, we have a Mean Gene interview with Dean Malenko, uh, again, at the entrance ramp. Um, and then uh, he comes out, and then uh, Jeff Jarrett and Deborah are with um, him. And uh, Deborah is, like, you know, checking out flirting um, with Alex Wright because Alex Wright's, you know, walking back up from his match back up the injured ramp and um you see him in the background deborah's like you know touching him and stuff like that and she's just like flirting with him um but dean you know says that he's working with uh jared and deborah i don't know exactly why like just to have some extra like another person you know watching his back but he's working with them um and talking about his uh matches again or match coming up with chris or with eddie guerrero next up we got it um six or again xpoc whatever you want to call them, match against ddp and this is the start of hour two this is match and then this time uh larry zabisco has gone and bobby heenan is in but um they're talking about showing like weeks before stuff um of ddp doing the diamond cutter and they're very much treating the diamond cutter like the rko is treated you know they're saying you know it can come out of nowhere and their um ddp can do it out of you know any moves and um that the crowd goes wild when he does it and they the crowd cheers and yells for it like the ddt um but six pot or x pac ends up doing his uh bronco buster but they called it a bronco ride which i didn't know he did it that early um in his career um ddp motions for the diamond cutter uh, but then vincent or virgil as you know comes running out which you saw him early in the first match um comes out interferes uh six goes put some sort of move i don't know what he's doing exactly but he grabs a hold of ddp's head and starts going towards the turnbuckle well, um ddp ends up reversing it into a diamond cutter and so of course crowd's going wild and um you know he's getting ready to go for a pin but kurt henning ends up running out and attacking ddp because they um i believe had a match the week before or sometime right before then so he ends up attacking him knocking ddp out and then grabs on to six and pulls six over ddp and so six gets the win in that match next up we get hector guerrero which i believe um i don't didn't know hector guerrero was ever in wcw at least at this point in time um but you know him that he played the gobbledygooker of course the famous thing from us uh, survivor series uh 91 90 91 i can't remember whichever one had the undertaker um appearance first undertaker appearance but he's just here as himself obviously hector Guerrero, and he's going off against in a match against dean malenko so with having those two guys you get a very um technical match um and commentary mentions that the Guerreros have been turning on each other of uh, pretty much eddie has been turning against um his brother hector at least i think it's his brother um his brother hector and his nephew chavo um and so there's something going on with eddie there and then uh jeff jerry and deborah end up coming out obviously since dean link is there and so they just end up coming out the ring so i don't really know that they do much of anything um but dean ends up winning the match with the texas cloverleaf and at the end of that you know jerry and deborah get in the ring and chavo ends up running out um and is like getting up in Jeff Jarrett's face. But uh, Dean comes up and attacks him from behind. Next up we get Conan. Um, comes out for an interview. Again on the entrance with uh, me Gene. And he talked about how he started every Mexican wrestler that is in the company in WCW. And that he's got a few uh, match coming up with Rey Mysterio. And that, uh, that uh, Mysterio is like you know his top person that he's going after but he's going to start with taking you know getting rid of all these wrestlers he brought in and he's going to start um in a match with the parka that's coming up then we get our famous or our lee marshall calls from so lee marshall ends up going to whatever town they're going to be in the next week and he like calls in your reports and he um they mention you know anything with matches coming up but he usually kind of even t talks about something related to the town so i think he talks about you know like car manufacturing and stuff like that um so yeah he calls in with his road report and if i didn't know this when i first did these video things earlier in the year but lee marshall was um did the voice of the um tony the tiger until he died which i think was pretty recently but so yeah he did the um was the old person that did the um, voice of tony the tiger um so then we get a match between the giant or so big show as you know versus the great muda which of course is a famous japanese wrestler and he's a part of the nwo so he wears face paint he has nwo written on his face in paint um, but before the Muda comes out, Macho Man ends up interrupting from the crowd. So he's standing up in the um, balcony of the crowd and he's there with Elizabeth and he's kind of promo on the giant, you know, about their um, 
match coming up at Road Wild, or I think it's Hog Wild. I think they've had both, I don't know. But then Muda ends up finally coming out, and as he's um, in the ring and the matches aren't getting ready to start, Eric Bischoff then comes walking out, and he comes over to the um, commentary table. And I think at this point, I can't remember, but I think it's just Bischoff and uh, Zabisco, or uh, Shivani, are the only two at the table that... I can remember. And so then they start the match or whatever um, while Bischoff's on, of course, making fun of the giant the whole time, especially the way he talks. But then um, so the match starts. Samuda goes, um, of course, right for the knee of the, um, the giant. Because obviously, if you're fighting a bigger guy, you want to get him down off his feet. And so, good way to do this, tacking the leg. Of course, all throughout this match, there's USA chance, as there would be at this point in time. Um, Muda, um, Big Show, or sorry, the giant ends up grabbing Muda to do the choke slam, but Muda spits his green mist into the giant's face, but giant has his arm up blocking it and so it doesn't really affect on him. So then he does the choke slam and ends up uh, getting the pin on Great Muda. And then we get Larry Zabisco coming back out to the commentary table and where he grabs a hold of Eric Bischoff in like a headlock and, head and with that headlock is like walking him uh, down to the ring. And of course the whole time Eric's like punching himself. So I assume they were like working punches or fake punches, but I, um, I mean, you think because it's uh, professional wrestling, but you never know with the stuff that was going on at that time. But he throws um, Bischoff into the ring where the giant then choke slams um, Bischoff, and that's the end of that. Next up, we get our match of Laparka, who comes out with Sonny Ono, which is a short uh, Japanese guy, and uh, he's facing off against Conan, like Conan mentioned earlier. Uh, Conan ends up. Uh, Hitting Laparka with a chair. I don't know really where the chair even came from. Like, I know Laparka used to always uh, come out with a chair. I don't know if he did at this point. But he ends up hitting Laparka with the chair. And Conan performs his uh, finishing move, the uh, Tequila Sunrise, for the win. And after that, uh, Psychosis comes running out um, and ends up, you know, causing Conan to lean the ring and run off. Because there's a whole little group um, of uh, Psychosis, Laparka, and Rey Mysterio, I believe. And so that's why Psychosis came right now. Then we get another um, on-the-phone interview with Tony Schiavone, and this time it's with J.J. Dillon. Of course, he's like the president or whatever running um, WCW. And he's saying that the match with Luger next week in Detroit is confirmed that it will happen and that he's off talking with the committee saying that they are working on an offer to try and get Sting back into matches and stuff by September. Of course, at this point, Sting hasn't like said anything or been in any matches since the end of um, the year before of 96. And so he said, you know, we're trying to get him back in the ring by September. And so then we get our uh, main event for the night, which is Macho Man, which and he's with Miss Elizabeth, which she um, is back in WCW, um, and she's a part of kind of like a force, like slave type person of the NWO. Um, at least she was at one point. Um, and uh, but they're not married at this time; they've divorced and been separated and stuff. So it's weird that they put them together again for this. Um, but it's. The, uh, Macho Man versus uh, Scott Steiner, who of course has Rick Steiner with him. And so Scott Steiner is beginning to turn into Scott Steiner. We know like he's starting to get really um, jacked and ripped. And um, he has his long hair and it's like all uh, pitch black. But of course, he, um, I think he ends up cutting it. And I think it stays black for a while or maybe he immediately turns it blonde, but I'm not sure. But he, I know soon he's going to take um, attack Rick Steiner and turn on him and join the NWO. Um, but uh, let's see, Macho Man keeps um, rolling out of the ring like I don't know if they even like touch each other but they may like you know lock up or something Macho Man rolls out but he keeps rolling out and he ends up taking a chair and throwing it into the ring and he's you know moving around the ring and stuff and Miss Scott starts to you know gets out of the ring and starts approaching him and he pulls Miss Elizabeth in between him which if you do know the stuff which if you know the stuff between Macho Man and Elizabeth he was super protective of her back in um, WWF and so that he's actually putting her in front of him you know as protection stuff and with the possibility of her getting getting hurt you see the difference of their relationship um so they start fighting and they fight into the crowd um savage goes for um of course they fight through the crowd come back into the ring um savage goes for his double axe handle off the um top row but scott ends up catching him and doing an overhead suplex at one point and then later on uh, towards the end of the match scott goes to do um the super frankensteiner off the ropes on macho man but uh, Liz elizabeth or i guess um scott does do the frankensteiner and then of course is going for the pin but miss elizabeth gets up on the rope as a distraction but rick steiner ends up grabbing her leg and pulling her off the um ring and then at that point, um, Hall and Nash come out of nowhere and attack um, Rick and Scott Steiner. And um, 
because obviously they have their match coming up and so that Hall and Ash weren't actually in Michigan. Um, Macho Man ends up performing on elbow on each of both Scott and Rick that the uh, Hall and Ash have laid out. Giant um, then comes running out and clears the NWO from the ring and so um, Giant and the Steiners are in the ring. Um, Macho Man and Hall and Ash are standing in the entryway and Giant's calling out um, Nash and you know saying like come face me big boy and all this sort of stuff and uh, Nash ends up like starting to walk back to the ring and he's climbing up or walking up the stairs to the ring and then Nitro ends because they run out of time whatever. So that is going to be it for the first week here of um, Monday Night Review going back 20 years to um, Raw and Nitro back during um, the Monday Night Wars and the what they call you know the Attitude Era and all that. Um, so two pretty decent shows like I said I'm a WWF guy so like I want to be like you know judge them on the quality but i'm you know not that certified to do that stuff and i'm always um biased towards raw and so i get more entertainment out of raw than i do nitro but they i think overall they were still two very good shows and especially with um raw and wwf at this time the stuff that's going on is for me at least very interesting and the stuff you know with bret hart and then his stuff with Shawn michaels his stuff with stone cold and all the whole dynamics of everything going on is me very interesting at this point in time but that's going to be it for this episode so if you enjoyed please leave a thumbs up leave any comments you have down below and hit the red subscribe button to um, catch up on all the episodes every week and we'll see you next time <laughs>